Good morning, everybody. Happy Friday. Thanks for being here with us today. I'm Katie Earl. I'm the coordinator of our University Express program, and we're joined here with Dr. Sharon Evans from Roswell. Welcome, Dr. Evans. Hi. Thanks for being here. So before we get into her presentation, we'll just quickly breeze through our housekeeping because we have some new folks on. We are recording the session and I'll try to post it on the website in the near future. And if you have any questions or comments while Dr. Evans is going through her presentation, please type those into the Q&A panel because we'll try to take questions throughout. So when something pops up for you, type it right in. She has her Q&A panel up and I have mine. So we'll try to address those things as they come up for you. And then we'll get to as many as we can at the end if things take a little bit to settle out and then you, you think of something at the end. So we'll thank our sponsors of our program, which is our Department of Senior Services, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Western New York, Celsius Orthopedics and Wegmans for all their support and senior services is 858-8526 if you ever need anything. All right, let's learn about the star of our show. Sharon Evans, PhD, is a professor of oncology in the Department of Immuno Immunology at Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center. She got her BA at Colgate University and received her doctoral training at New York University and then the University of Buffalo. She joined the faculty of the Department of Immunology at Roswell Park in 1987, and Dr. Evans has maintained a long-standing commitment to graduate education, receiving multiple mentorship awards, and she's here with us today. Thank Thank you, Dr. Evans. The floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Katie. Um, it's really a pleasure. And I'll just ask right before we start. So, Katie, is the volume still good? Because I was getting a lot of feedback when you were talking. So, um, it, it's you fine. You sound great. Yep. And I'll be muted. So, that's on my end. But you're okay, perfect. Okay, no problem. I'm just going to change this pen a little. So, um, welcome, everyone. I have to say that I regret that I won't see you this in person. We normally do these, and Katie and I have a lot of fun with the, the in person presentations. I happen to be one of those speakers that really enjoys and thrives off the audience. I like to see people's faces and I see if they look perplexed. I know I need to explain something. So, as Katie said, if you have a question, you don't even have to type your full question. You could just literally type, I have a question. And um, one of us, either Katie or I, should see that so we can um, come to you if there are any things that you need clarified on the way through. So, the title of my seminar is Immunotherapies for the Two C's. And we're talking about the famous C we all know about COVID as well as cancer. And I decided to change this up, but we're, of course, I'm at Roswell Park. We're a cancer immunology program, um, and it's our opportunity to really tell you about cancer immunotherapy. And the interesting thing, as we've been doing this over the years, is more and more people in the audience actually are not just learning about immunotherapy for cancer, but they are taking it. So, you know, it's really been a great opportunity to get out into the community. But over the weekend, I was watching my favorite best baseball team, the Yankees, and they had a guest on who was an expert, um, in actually a cancer survivor, but he also runs all over the country, this um, kind of a, a charity donation for cancer. But what struck me is how he appreciated the parallels between our efforts for treating COVID and for cancer. And I thought, you know, I, this is a great time to bring these thoughts together right up front. So that's my plan today. And really what it all comes down to is this concept that in both cases, when we're treating COVID and we're treating cancer, we're the whole goal is to use your body's entire immune system to fight both kinds of um, severe diseases. So it, it's different than how we often think about using drugs, which is to attack the aggressor. So either attack the virus or attack the cancer cell itself. This is a different thing, and that's really going to be the theme of what we talk about. And I want to give you really you know, the background, the scaffolding to understand what our goals are and what we're trying to achieve. I think everyone that's zoomed in on this understands the immune response. Probably everybody is more expert in the immune system because of our events in the past year than we ever have been. So it's probably a lot like talking to my graduate school students um, here where we train for PhDs here. So 
Now the challenge will be is if we can move the slides. There we go. So, you know, um, all of us on this are of an age that we remember certain major events. We all remember, we were old enough to remember where, where we were when John Kennedy was shot. I think as we move forward, it's going to be exactly the same thing. We are going to crystal clear remember the events of the past year of COVID. And for all of us, you know, all the images, the healthcare workers that ventured out under severe duress and truly taking risks for their own life and their family is just so moving and inspirational. This is a picture of my daughter. What we would do is every Friday, she would, um, I'm on this video thing, we would do Zoom and we would take part on the Friday seven o'clock clap in New York City. She and her husband, um, they own a place up on the Upper East Side. So here we are clapping and taking part. I'll never forget that my son and his family, um, our little tiny, she's two in this picture, two and a half um, in Boston. You know, these images of a, a two and a half year old having to wear a mask, we will never forget. But it, I also, so in, in spite of the stress and the duress that we've all um, taken, there, as with every kind of catastrophic situation, there are incredible leaps forward in medicine. I, we could spend this whole talk talking about Vietnam and the surgeries that came out of Vietnam, the chemotherapy that came out of the mustard gases that, you know, were devastating in World War I. World War II, the surgery advances for burns and transplantation, multiple Nobel Prizes came out of that work. So what we're going to talk about is the amazing leap forward we've made and the impact it will have actually on cancer treatment because of COVID. So at Roswell Park, um, I have fused in my memory the date where we closed, which was March 18th, because I had a major grant due at the NIH which is where we go for funding. Yes, exactly. It was really traumatic. So about three weeks before, I also took part in NIH study sections and I started to think to myself, this is so dire. Even with the news coming out of just a few cases in the United States, I, I was like, we are going, we're going, this is going to be a pandemic and we are going to be shutting down. So my grant was due in April and we worked, we never left for weeks because we had to get the grant in and we were convinced we knew there would probably be a deadline, but we would be off site. It would be really difficult. So we just did everything we could and we submitted the grant the same day the Institute closed. So we submitted it a month early. So, um, which for me, at least is quite unheard of. So, and then um, Roswell opened up. We were one of the first in the area to reopen May 5th. The, it, the clinical side, which is over here, never closed, of course, because patients are not in the situation to have the luxury to go home. So, um, but, but the research side, and some of us are over here, we have research buildings all over the place. I, I'm, I'm sitting up here in this, this little building right now, um, but we reopened May 5th. So, the, one of the things that um, is kind of intuitively obvious why am I, why is COVID a priority when we're talking about a cancer center where our entire focus here is to treat cancer? And it really comes down to the cancer treatment, as I just mentioned, as well as the research can't wait. We, we lost billions of dollars as a, a scientific community across the world because of shutdowns, because these experiments were up and going, there's no way to stop them except just to throw them away. So the loss in terms of scientific advances is probably immeasurable, but obviously treatments can't wait either. So Roswell was really at the forefront, as many of you in the community know, for taking very proactive measures to treat the, to protect their patients, but also to make sure that the frontline workers, the health work, care workers, everyone from the custodial to the cafeteria, everybody had to be protected because these patients are incredibly vulnerable. So it was a, a tremendous responsibility. I wrote up a lot of the standard operating procedures for safety in the labs so that we could go back for the Institute. So and it, that's why Roswell became positioned as a very, very early state de designated mandated testing site for COVID because we had the expertise, 
to put those PCR very rapid tests into place really quickly because that's what people do all the time. That's how they monitor cancer. So, um, you know, it's a really interesting, and I, I have to say, I was really proud to be part of the Institute's efforts as well, but worldwide as part of the scientific community and human, human society. The, the fact that healthcare workers, here, here's um, somebody being trained to, for, in terms of how to give the vaccine for uh, the outer community. And also Roswell has some of the world's leading experts in immunology. So it's not so surprising that Roswell would take such an active role. So um, what I wanted to do today is really talk about these two tracks that I think most of us would think of as separate parallel tracks the COVID vaccine therapy, which is a type of immunotherapy, and the immunotherapy for cancer. But we'll talk about the fact that not only are they parallel, but they're incredible cross fertilization in these fields, and they've come to converge, and that we are learning back and forth because of the two fields. I hope I can convince you today that the advances that we made so quickly in COVID vaccine immunotherapy were not possible without cancer immunotherapy. And then I really think it's going to come circling back and some of the cancer immunotherapy advances, particularly the formats for the mRNA vaccines, which we'll talk about a little bit more, are, are really benefiting. These have been in under um, exploration for over 10 years. And look what happened in terms of vaccines. They got rolled out in 10 months. So one of the things I just want to mention is response to viruses and cancer are nothing new. We, we like to think those of us that got our PhDs in this in this generation that you know we're at the front edge and cutting edge. But the truth is, we've been dealing with these issues well before recorded time. The first records, coincidentally, were virus infections, and that was smallpox, as well as cancer, came out of Egypt at 1500 BC. So this is a long, long-standing issue and problem. Viruses, the especially deadly viruses, the pandemic associated with smallpox was so deadly that people were willing to take incredible risks. So, for example, the pilgrims would literally take their healthy children and put them in a crib with a child that they thought was not super sick with smallpox, rub them up against each other and hope their baby would get smallpox, which was, yeah, and, and the whole idea was maybe if they got a mild form, then they'd be protected. That's a good idea. The problem is smallpox was so deadly, more deadly than COVID, that of five people listening to this program, if you infect five people were infected with smallpox, two would die. And those statistics are the same now as they were back thousands of years ago. So the only advance we've really had is that we have vaccines. So there, you know, and I think that it's the same thing. We have emergency. Um, use authorization for vaccines because we understand how dire and how dangerous COVID is. So it's the same thing. So the points I really want to make today is that all of these um, therapies that we're talking about are founded on absolute new discovery and unprecedented, unprecedented collaboration. So I'll try to make those points on the way through. So success for any of the therapies directed against COVID or against cancer ultimately depends on understanding how the immune system works. And though while we've made tremendous advances, especially understanding the nuts and bolts of the immune system in the last 100 years um, and incredible in the last 50 years, but we still have a long way to go. And then the last piece is just to remind you that when we talk about immunotherapy, it literally means using, as we mentioned on the very first slide, the body's own immune network to either prevent viral infections like COVID or all its friends, its little variants and mutations, and as well as to treat cancer. So those are the themes that we'll just be talking about today. And again, if there's anything I need to clarify, there are a couple of things I want to um, really talk about before we even get into this, but we're talking about immunotherapy, which I, uh, immunotherapy as it applies to COVID vaccine, and we'll talk more about these investigators as well as for immunotherapy. So here's kind of the conventional way of thinking of viral infections. We have a lot of drugs. We of course have vaccines. Vaccines are hoping to prevent getting the disease. Now the problem is, is once you get it, 
just like I mentioned for smallpox, there are no treatments to this day. If you get smallpox, there are zero treatments. And that's true for a lot of the viruses. You can treat the symptoms, you can put people in the hospital, you can ventilate them. We all have seen all of that in the past year with COVID. But there are no, there's no way to stop the drug once uh, once the um, the virus infection. So there are drugs though that can sort of slow it down, and they work by either killing the virus. So here here's a cell. This is the famous COVID virus. We all know that COVID. The word comes from the word uh, Corona, which is a crown. So these are my little drawings of the COVID virus, but you can see it has this little rim, the little crown. That little crown, these little spiky guys on the outside is exactly how the virus can attach to the cell. And it, think of it as its entryway. It's your front door to getting into the cell by binding like that. So the cell's infected. There are drugs, a lot of the advances have been made with um, HIV and AIDS. The virus that causes AIDS is HIV. There are drugs that will block, it will either kill the virus, it will block the ability of the virus to multiply within cells, and it can actually block the ability of the virus to infect. So they exist. The difference here is when we talk about um, the immunotherapies that we're talking about, they are based on the idea of not necessarily treating the, once you have the infection, but trying to prevent the infection by vaccinating. And we've all been vaccinated. Actually, a lot of people that are on this are, are my age. So we've all been vaccinated with smallpox, which is interesting because they stopped in the 70s. Katie has not been vaccinated, but we've been vaccinated. So, you know, um, the goal there is then you, the idea is that you're invoking the immune system. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about the specifics of that so you have a better idea. But it's very different than attacking the pathogen or microbe itself. It's getting an indirect effect, but incredibly effective at controlling and preventing this infection from spreading. So that's the idea. And it's similar for cancer. Cancer, I think, is easier for us all to relate to because we're all, uh, unfortunately for all of us, both my parents had cancer, in fact, um, but we're all pretty aware of the issues about chemotherapy, radiation. There are certain types of immunotherapies already in place that have been well used, particularly breast cancer comes to mind, that use um, antibodies. There are hormonal therapies. The goal of all these conventional therapies is to attack the tumor cell. That's the problem. It's a problem when it grows at its first site. It's a bigger problem when it spreads and it involves organs we need. We all know from last the past year, we all how much we depend on our lungs. And so, which is where COVID is so devastating. Well, lung can, lung tumors will spread. They love to go to the lungs. They love to go to the liver. They like to go to the brain. So. The goal here of conventional therapy is to use these drugs and blow apart the tumor. That's the that idea. The new therapies are, again, very similar to what we talked about in that parallel I wanted to mention of between COVID and cancer, the two Cs, is that they are different. The end goal is the same, blow apart that tumor cell, but the tools that we use are different. We are using the immune system, this killer T cell, which has the ability to recognize and blow apart the tumor cell. And so what we've begun to appreciate is that for effective therapies to work, we're, we need combinations. We need chemotherapy with these immunotherapies to blow them apart. We use radiation. Most of the clinical trials that are under investigation right now um, involve combinations. So with that, I want to get into some of the more um, basic information about COVID vaccines, highlighting some of these main points. There, I don't think will be any question when we finish that the, the concept of novel discovery will, should come across if all the other things are a little bit too detailed. So before we get into that, there are three things I wanted to bring up though in terms of COVID. I've done a lot of interviews and so on to try to get out information from an immunology point of view. And so there's some myths floating around that I thought, and this, it, welcome any questions to clarify. I, I do not treat 
COVID, and I am not an expert, but well informed, and so I might be able to help with with any confusion you might have. But one, uh, I put this one as my favorite out of the box thing I've heard. We do the Zoom with my best friends from college, and my um, this one best friend was talking about how she's taking a walk through Central Park the other day, and she had she um. She didn't have a mask. You don't have to have a mask on if you're vaccinated in Central Park, but her friend had a mask because she wasn't vaccinated and she's very leery about the vaccine. So, you know, but so they were talking and we all know why you wear a mask if you weren't vaccinated to prevent exposure to someone that has COVID. What surprised all of us was when this person said, oh, no, I'm not wearing my mask because of that. I'm wearing my mask because it will keep me from catching the vaccine from you. Shocking, right? Because of course, and so I want to clarify that while masks have been incredible, not only have they helped protect us from COVID, but the number of cases for influenza have gone way, way down. You know, a lot of infectious disease have gone way down that are airborne because of masking, social distancing, and washing hands. It actually works. But what it never will protect you from is catching the vaccine. The vaccine is not something that we spread from, I wish it was that easy. Nope, you have to get a shot. You have to usually get two shots. You have to go through the, you know, getting back and forth every two weeks, all of that. There is no way you can get the vaccine, even these new vaccines. So if anybody has any confusion about that, um, you know, I want to, that was a point I really wanted to clarify. I didn't even appreciate that that was out there. So, um, any questions at all about that that aspect in terms of um, the vaccine? I'm going to get into the, what the vaccine really entails because I know there are a lot of misconceptions there. But if anybody has anything, just don't hesitate. Perfect. So the second issue is fever. This is the age we're in. We are used to either go to the grocery store, the doctor, the pharmacy. Actually, I went to the Galleria Mall to drop um, for the first time since I've been, and it was only because I had to return something. So, and, um, and Jay Jill's, there they were. I was getting screened for my fever. We go, th we have to self screen um, for temperature every day we walk in. But there's a conception out there, a misperception that the fever is actually what's making you sick. And so that actually is not the case, but it's easy to understand why you feel that way. You certainly feel sick when you have a fever, no question about it. And the first thing we do is grab something that will help relieve the fever and make us feel better. But um, there have been a lot, and because we had done a lot of research over the years um, at kind of high impact type journals, we got a lot of interest in all these types of conversations. So here's one I did with the CBC where they talked about the, C, the, um, the Center for Disease Control in the United States had come out and said that when you got the vaccine, even though one of the side effects of the vaccine is fever, and people got really concerned because they felt like they were actually getting the disease and that the fever was making them sick. But what, pe what the CDC was recommending is you not take any of these drugs while you were getting the vaccine. Let it take its course unless you can't stand it. Um, my, interestingly, those um, those recommendations changed in the middle of mine. I was vaccinated in January because we're at Roswell Park in a health center. And uh, so the first vaccine they told us to take Tylenol and the second one they said, oh, don't take it. So, but the bottom line is that there are actually benefits to, of the fever itself. It's parting, part of what's amplifying your immune system. So this is part of out of this interview. It actually is like a bell ringer telling you that your body is reacting to the vaccine. And that's a good thing. You want to ramp up your immune response. And fever, so this is one that's coming out and this really cool thing, um, platform, Minute Earth through YouTube, which I didn't know about until uh, we've been going back and forth with these extensive interviews. But what they condense, I've had at least four interviews with um, Kate Yoshida uh, on this, and they condense it down to three and a half minutes. My kind of science. And it's awesome. I totally recommend, look, just Google Minute Earth. They have the most amazing things. They have a great article right now going about what are the unexpected benefits that came out of COVID. 
And I think you'll be fascinated, but they have all kinds of really fun ones. Why does your heart rate go up when you're at a stoplight? And, you know, just fun things. They do an incredibly good job. They're really, really well-trained scientists that then take information from people like me and distill it down. So one of the things we talked about is fever. You know, it, okay, it's great that uh, people like me and others say that the research points to it being a benefit, but why go to all that trouble? It costs a lot for our body in terms of energy and how much we have to eat and all, so on, and energy that gets diverted from other things to, to mount a fever. Even one degree, it costs a lot. So why bother? The curious thing is species, if you walk, talk, fly or crawl on this earth, you can get a fever. And even that's true, even for animals like cold blooded animals. So these are actually just my rendition of some of the study subjects we've used in our published work. We've used everything from tigers, rhinos, we had a great collaboration with the Buffalo Zoo, but even a cold blooded animal, a fish that can't make its own fever will get a fever because when animals like that are sick, the fish swims right up to the top of the water to raise its temperature. And if you prevent that from happening, the it's the virus that they get or the bacteria is lethal. So there is a real benefit to fever. And in higher animals that we like to think of ourselves, mammals, it's all tied up with the immune system. So here's just one more. This is one from Jane Brody that we did um, with the New York Times. So she also was curious about this whole thing. Is there a benefit of fever? And why are we all so afraid of it, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, other than the fact, let's face it, nobody feels good when you have a fever. But it's part of the basic biology of telling you to hunker down, go get under some blankets, pull them up over your head and, and just hang out because Actually, from the point of view of society, we don't want somebody walking around who's sick. We want them hiding out in their apartment or their house and, and trying to get better. So it's all actually all part of a big weird plan. But um, the, one of the things that came out that um, if you're interested in sort of background reading is this point that the immune system, every aspect of the immune system is actually boosted by fever. So the fact that you get a fever when you are vaccinated is not a reason to worry about the vaccine. It actually means it's, it's working. But not everybody mounts a fever. I didn't get fevers at all when I got the Pfizer vaccine. So not everybody does. Our bodies respond differently. So so um, the last piece, and, I, and there's one more kind of myth that I, I want to debunk, and that will be embedded in this, is let's talk about COVID vaccine and the founded by new discovery. And it was really, um, I, what I want to juxtapose is that historically, and for very good reasons, it takes a huge, huge, I used to be at Merck, a huge, which is a huge pharmaceutical company, incredible expenditure of funds to get something to clinic and get it approved, all right? So it usually takes 10 to 15 years even to develop a vaccine that has legs and is, can be successful. The record was way back in 67, when it took four years to get a mumps vaccine, all right? Compare that to COVID, from start to end, it was 10 months to get it out, rolled out into patients and uh, you know healthy people. So the timeline is this. We all know that um, the first case was reported in Wuhan, China for COVID and then after that, not too long afterwards, the first, first case in the United States was January 19th. It was a 35-year-old man. He visited Wuhan. He came back. He was sick. And guess what? He had it. And what everybody appreciated was how infectious it was. My brother got it from his son, who's an electrician, and two workers came to work with COVID knowing they had it. Everybody in this electrical group got it, came home, and a family of four all four of them got it. So remind yourself that's what's different about COVID. Influenza, maybe one of us in the house might get it and then the rest will be okay. So it's very infectious and people realize that right away. On the 24th, two scientists who lead a very small company called BioNTech in Germany are reading about this, getting emails from colleagues in China saying this is bad. I was getting emails from one of my colleagues in China. So this was actually coming out. So Dr. Sahin and his wife, Dr. Tursik, 
who are really big leaders, but they were worried. They're reading about it. And this, I think, is inspirational. And I was reminded, preparing for this lecture, of kind of the course of events, because they read this article on the 24th. They have breakfast. And over breakfast, they say, we need to completely divert all our efforts in our small company away from what we do, which we're experts in cancer immunotherapy. And we've been working on mRNA therapies for 10 years. We're going to take all our resources, divert it, and we're going to put it into trying to come up with a vaccine as fast as possible for COVID. And then they have to go to work. And fortunately, they were the major shareholders and convinced this company. They had everything at stake on cancer to just stop it and change. They called up Pfizer. They had a personal relationship with Pfizer. And they said, we think we have an avenue to get a vaccine really quickly, not in four years, which would be an incredible event, yeah, but as fast as possible. So their plan when they met was based on the infection rate and you do the math and it's exactly what they thought would happen, happened. All of us as scientists were, were really alarmed was that we have to get this vaccine developed and into people in April starting in January, the end of January. So incredible. This is before the World Health even announces it's a pandemic. They beat it by a month. By March, they already have clinical trials going um, for to look at the safety and is this drug okay? Because as I'm going to point out, it's a completely different format that's ever been used for vaccines. It had only been under experimental in, uh, um, you know, preclinical studies, not in patients, this whole um, platform. And that was all for cancer. So the application to virus was novel and the whole approach. So they beat it by a month. Another company, Moderna, as we all know, had a similar format. But, and I'm going to tell you why these, these came to the forefront, even though they're not conventional. By July and August, they got the first safety results saying that, in fact, that this could be well tolerated. So that's what we call phase one and phase two trials. So not really seeing if it's effective at preventing disease, but the whole goal is do people get sick with the virus? So, so that's all came out, looked good, but nothing really mattered until November. And that's when the results came back for both Moderna as well as the Pfizer BioNTech um formulations that now they had over 40,000 people enrolled and now they're looking to see if they're protected from disease people and vaccines are looking for um protection in the 60 percent range 70 percent range the shock to all of us nobody would believe this it's in the 90 percent range 90 95 so it's incredible and that's on the basis of that that the um, the our federal government granted this emergency use authorization eua which is also unprecedented because they weighed how dangerous the disease was and how many people were going to die on unquestioned from the disease versus the risk for putting this therapy forward but knowing that it had tremendous safety, it had safety in 40,000 plus people for each trial. It had also all the safety work of, that led up to it. So this is what we're dealing with. Here's the virus is just um, fake co coloring. So it, it really in life is not green and it's not attacking really a yellow cell. But look, at, I mean, we're not dealing with one particle of virus. They are covered with virus. This is what we're trying to fight is that potent infection. So the mRNA vaccines, I want to talk about that really briefly as well. And that because I think there are a lot of misconceptions. So my own brother wrote to me about this. All his friends were concerned and he was as well. He has Parkinson's. So he had real concerns about the concept that this vaccine, which we know is based on genetic material, is it going to get into my DNA and change my DNA and my basic functions, my ability to make every protein in my body that makes me alive. And so it, what I, I call that in my own head, um, the GMO, GMO for fear factor. So, you know, we're all concerned about genetically modified organisms. And so this would be the big one when we're modifying ourselves. So, so I want to just talk about that approach right now, just so that it's really clear what this is. And the answer is absolutely no. 
it never ever modifies your basic DNA. No, 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 no. So, um, which is hard to put in a text, I can tell you. But I had to call my brother because I was like, no, doesn't really answer it. So I want to just quickly go through, here's the virus. Here's this little crown with the spike proteins. The spike proteins are what allow it to bind to a human cell. They happen to also be a great thing for the immune system to recognize because the immune system can say, this is not human. This is definitely foreign and we are under attack. We need to marshal all our forces to fight it. So the spike protein is encoded by an RNA, a messenger RNA. That's where mRNA comes from in the virus. And here's the little code. All right. And it's like um, a blueprint for making you know, a blueprint you use to make a building, your house, right? Well, in this case, the blueprint has all the letters and codes to tell the builder how to make the protein. So this blueprint, the mRNA, in the end of the day, will make the spike protein. That's how viruses live. They infect a cell, they co-op, they take over all the machinery in the cell, and the poor cell has no chance. Instead of doing all the things it needs to do as a lung cell to breathe and exchange oxygen, it gets stuck into this whole root where it's just its job now becomes to help the virus survive, and it makes all the machinery for the virus. That's really what a virus does. So the scientists, Dr. Sahin and Dr. Chursek, took that, and they're tricking the cell. So they put the mRNA for the spike into a little lipid droplet. They modify the RNA so that it survives better in the body, because normally, actually, they don't when they're free like this. And then the cell will take it up. And then it has a little RNA that goes into its cell. But here's the deal. This is why it can never get into our DNA, is because it's in the wrong place at the wrong time. The, the mRNA stays out in the cytoplasm. It never, ever, ever goes into the, DNA, into the center of the cell, the nucleus, which is the brain of the cell. That's where your DNA is. So they are physically never in the same place. And RNA never goes into DNA. It's actually the opposite direction. DNA makes RNA. So, so that just can't happen. This is just one of those really bad information things that is rampant on the internet. You will find things like this, but it's wrong. So that's one piece. And then the second piece is that our body, we have in us all the time little, um, little, little safeguards to prevent things from going wrong. And one of them is we have little scissors little enzymes that literally, if they see free mRNA, they break it down. That's their job, clip, clip, clip. And so normally our cells don't care because we make all the RNA we need. In this case, as a therapy, you're just adding the RNA. So it's good because it's so well protected. The worry we all had as scientists, and that's what's held up its development as a therapy, even in cancer for 10 years, is that it will be clipped so rapidly that it won't matter. You won't get the chance to generate an immune system. And luckily for all of us who have taken the vaccines, that didn't turn out to be the case, but that was the serious worry. And Pfizer themselves were very worried about partnering, but it's just, you had no choice. We couldn't wait for anything else to come up. So end of the day, you make this, you, you, co you get your cell, your own body cells to make the spike protein. And basically what you've done now is tricked your immune system. The immune system doesn't know if the spike protein came from a human cell through this therapy or because of the virus. All it knows is it's a bad thing and they better react fast because they, the immune system understands that the virus will replicate in minutes and will swamp your body. That's the bottom line. So the immune system ramps up and you make antibodies. And here's that magic. You know how they always tell us it's two weeks before we're really protected? Well, that's because this is the two weeks. It's because it takes that long. This is a very, very complicated response for your immune cells to make enough antibody that would be protective. And then, then as far as why those antibodies matter, they can bind directly to the virus and they physically bind to that little spike protein. And now it can't reach and bind and infect. They also recognize of cells that are infected, they have the spike protein, just like this one, and the antibody will come in and clear out those cells. 
So, so it's a very, very, very controlled immune response. And it's making the same response whether you have, are you infected with a regular everyday cold or whether you're infected with COVID. So it's the same idea. Um, this concept of antibodies is being used therapeutically because in some people, they can't really make these antibodies all that well. As we get older, our ability to, for the immune response to be so flexible goes down somewhat. So there are a lot of therapies out there. We see this on TV, all of you that I see it all the time watching Yankees games where it says, if you've gotten COVID, call your doctor, you might want to get monoclonal antibody therapy. That's literally just making what has been produced, these antibodies, short-circuiting the immune system, not depending on it, and just swamping your body with the antibody that's protective. So that's what's um, coming out. So there's a lot of interest in that as a therapy to help support if the vaccine doesn't work. And then the last piece is that you don't just want antibodies. A really good fighting force involves these T lymphocytes. They have the ability to recognize an infected cell and kill it. So that's the bottom line. And in terms of COVID, the Pfizer um, BioNTech um, vaccine is really effective against the original virus. We're all worried about the variants and it, it goes down, but still effective. Moderna is very effective, but all mRNAs are not the same. Here's one that just was reported um, this week. It's another mRNA, mRNA virus, only 47% effective thank goodness for all of us that wasn't the one that was the first one that came out because we'd all be in trouble so so um moving forward I, I, as far as that goes i think did you say is there something we, we have a question that came through that i think might be good for this point um it's how do you respond to people who are still afraid to get the covid vaccine because they feel it was developed too fast and not tested enough yeah that's a great question and thanks i didn't see it here so um yeah it's such a good question because there are many people that are still afraid and have a basic you know concern about it so i and because it's a new vaccine i think it's fair to have some concerns it's probably safer than any other vaccine formulation we've ever had um with the exception of when you just put the protein in itself so um i think right now it's risk versus benefit that's what we always approach everything in terms of clinical medicine so are there some risks to the to the therapy um, not because it's an mRNA formulation, but just generating a, a response to something that's so inflammatory, there may be risks for some people with underlying conditions. And that because it hasn't been tested over 10 years, we're not going to know that yet. Problem is, we really can't wait, especially with these variants taking over. There are already all these companies that are making vaccines to the variants. So in my view, the way at least I pr approach it with my family in talking about it is that the, the benefits are far outweighing the risks. The protection level is so unexpectedly high that, um, and, and the risks because of those inborn controls that I talked about in safeguards are not super high. Most people that get the vaccine, it's, it's a very limited kind of control. It's not a really, really inflammatory response. So, so um, yeah, hopefully, does that answer that question? I think it does, thank you. Okay, perfect. So um, given the time, because I've spent too much on, on uh, the COVID vaccine, I think what we're going to do is I'm just gonna move ahead and go into cancer vaccines and then bring it together. So um, I was going to talk a little bit more about the history, but I think that it, many of you have heard about some of the background. Obviously, everybody knows Pasteur, but all of this background um, has also been really important for cancer immunotherapy. And so, and then there's the crosstalk that's involved. So the bottom line in cancer therapy is really very similar to what we just talked about. The end goal is to take a, a, t a tumor cell and have it attacked by a T cell. And the T cell is armed with, it's like a full army. It has all the ammunition to kill the tumor cell. These are, um, it, we see them in real life. This is uh, from my own lab. Here's a tumor cell under attack. Here are the T cells glomming on and poking holes and killing the tumor cell. It's a very active process. Um, and the immune response to 
is very different than chemotherapy because it's so specific. So while it can attack this tumor cell, if you have right next door a normal lung cell that you need to breathe, the T cells won't see it at all. They only will kill the tumor cells. So specificity is so important. It's a very um, effective response. It will attack tumors that you can't take out with surgery or are resistant to the traditional pillars, chemotherapy and radiation. Um, and the key is that also can get a long response. So we, I'll just show one video from our lab if I can. And I can't. So the videos don't work, which is no problem. Let me just see one thing. So basically, um, it was just going to show you in action. It takes about six hours for a T cell to kill and blow apart a tumor cell. So um, let's just go on to that. Long tradition. William Coley is credited with doing the very first immunotherapy studies, and he was driven by the fact that one of his earliest patients got cancer and it couldn't be cured. And he used um, different ways of boosting the immune system, including generating a fever as part of his response. He got some incredible results, absolutely groundbreaking, but they were like one case here, one case there. So it, it started the whole concept of immunotherapy, but isn't used that much as a therapy, except in a bladder cancer now. So Roswell Park, the man, which we are named after was an incredible surgeon. He was um, one of the best surgeons in the entire world back in 100 years ago when he started the first Institute Roswell Park, and here we are today. Um, he realized the importance of the immune system to fight cancer really early on, way ahead of the game. That's what I admire about him. I actually wrote part of my thesis on his desk. So, because it's still in a library, and so I, I got to do that, and he's very inspirational, but he hired physicians and scientists that wanted to invoke the immune system to fight cancer very, very early on. And if for anybody that has any interest, um, we've done some a lot of podcasts about the first immunotherapy with William Coley. Um, I've done actually probably about five with this team, um, Terry and um, Terry and Joe Graydon at the People's Pharmacy. Um, but these are two, if you want any background information about sort of the history or how the immune system can be mobilized um, that you could just take a look at for basic information. Bottom line, it's all driven back and forth by clinical research and basic research. And I'm, go I'm, not, I'm going to skip the molecules, but give you the bottom line is that basically the entire immune system in our body depends on a balance between the accelerator and the brakes. That's how it really works. So in the simplistic form, if we're fighting a COVID virus, and we're infected. We have the first immune activation phase, which takes a couple of weeks, same as with the vaccine. And then we have the attack phase where there are, we have antibodies, we have T cells, and we are literally killing the virus. But you don't want to continue. Once you've cleared the virus, the key is you don't, you don't keep it with the immune response. We have in, in us, little stop signals that will bring it back down. And that protects us from over damage because if you have a killing machine going on too much, then you have damage to your tissues. And that's literally the essence is autoimmune disorders, rheumatoid arthritis, diabetes, all the disorders that we all deal with would happen if you don't have good control. So in the case of cancer, this happens to be breast cancer cell, we want to have the activation phase. This would be ideal. But in cancer, because you have metastasis, it's in our body, there's a chance of it coming back. We really would like to not have a stop signal and we wanna keep going for as long as possible. Problem is it really looks a lot more like a virus response. We haven't cleared the tumor necessarily, but when it's very, very small and we don't even know where it is and the clinical people don't, your doctors don't know where it is, our immune system comes back down. The stop signals come into play and you turn it off. We know a ton now about these stop signals and what they are at a molecular level. I'm not going to go through that. I had hoped I would, but I'm not going to because of time. But basically, we now have therapies that can go in and get rid of the stop signals and we can have a longer response. And so that's the bottom line for immunotherapy. A couple of Nobel Prizes were given. Here's Jim Allison, um, a colleague that we know well. He didn't even know. He went to New York 
for a meeting. He's at um, he's at the MD Anderson in, in Houston. He's having he's out wandering about having dinner when his son is desperately calling because he got the call that he got the Nobel Prize. But the key about this is the very first Nobel Prize shared by with also with Tansuku um, Hongzhou in um, in Japan that gave the Nobel Prize for the treatment of cancer. And the whole idea was to remove the brakes on the immune system so that they can attack cancer long time. So incredible, incredible novel discoveries it actually came out of understanding viruses and the immune response. So a lot of thinking about, shouldn't we also be thinking about a Nobel Prize for the groups that made the COVID vaccines? Unbelievable efforts, heroic efforts. And there's some op-eds on this. I had fun reading about this. The truth is, and we all know this is scientists, but I'm wondering if something won't happen worldwide to mobilize and influence the Nobel Prize um, Award Committee. But usually pharmaceutical companies never, ever, ever get awards because it's just considered that that's industry. But I would argue that there's nothing that's affected global health, which is the goal of the Nobel Prize and global um, global society more than what's happened with COVID. So, so what, let's go not go through the details here. We know a lot of the players that provide the stop signal, the therapies, the immunotherapies that people are on, like Keytruda, Optivo, Yervoy, et cetera, all involve making antibodies to block those stop signals and physically get in there and not let them interact. And as a result, now this T cell can happily kill the tumor cell. That's what all the therapies depend on. So there have been really great successes. We all see these on TV. Here's somebody that's been on TV now for a number of years, Keytruda. I have no vested interest in any of these companies as far as their drugs. It's just they had a car and it went with the stop of this accelerator. I'm very visually and I love art. So this is this is one. But it's turning out that in some cancers, really aggressive cancers, like non-small cell lung carcinoma, melanoma, that the, the, this type of therapy, this immune therapy is more effective than chemotherapy. They always say, you know how they have the fine print on TV? You know, you can never listen and I, I don't even look at it. But they always say that these immunotherapies will not work for everyone. And that's where we are in 2021, is trying to understand the goals. So one goal for both shared for COVID and cancer immunotherapy is long lived protection. We need to have long lived protection. We're going to be dealing with these COVID viruses forever, I'm afraid. And we're probably going to be vaccinated every year to deal with the effect of all the variants, just like we are for influenza. We need to understand mechanisms of resistance and we need to better be able to pick out which patients are likely to respond to the therapy and which ones won't. So I'm going to end on those concepts. The immune system is really has the memory like an elephant. So we, you all heard on the news the comparisons between the COVID pandemic and what happened 100 years ago is facetiously called the Spanish flu, even though it started here in Kansas. But um, it, it was kind of first reported in Spain and it was a pandemic. It, what we found out is that people 100 years later um, or 90 years later that we're still alive, they still have circulating antibodies to the infection they got back in 1918. And it's the same, we talk a lot about smallpox. People like you, all of you on, online and me that have been vaccinated for smallpox 50 years later, we still have circulating antibodies. So it's very, very long lived. That's the goal for COVID. We wanna have long lived res responses to the infection to help protect us. And then it's the very same for cancer immunotherapy. The other aspect is um, resistance. So we are having some successes, non-small cell lung carcinoma, high level of success, melanoma. Others like breast cancer, we are having successes, but the percents are low, 18.5. So most people aren't responding. So understanding that mechanism of resistance is important. For COVID, it's a little different, right? Because Let's say Pfizer against um, the Delta type variant is showing about 88% response rate so far. Um, so that's great. 12% aren't responding. That doesn't sound so bad until you do the numbers. I did this last night just for my own 
edification. If everybody in the United States, every single person, man, woman, child, was vaccinated and 12% were resistant, that's 39 million people. It's a lot of people. So we need to understand the mechanisms of resistance. And we're getting a lot of clues from research. Cancer research is one. And I just wanted to mention a graduate student in my own group who's been working on this, where different types of immune cells interact with the T cells in the tumor. The tumor is not just tumor. It's all these immune cells that live there too. And we found that these cells are prevalent in the blood. They suppress the immune system. They're another stop signal, different, but the end result is the same. They stop the T cell from killing. And so they actually, you can look in the blood and you can find these cells and they're highly elevated to, compared to a healthy donor blood. This would be a patient with breast cancer. And so they have these immune suppressive events. It turns out all these 30 years and 4,000 plus publications from cancer are informing COVID. So here's a report. Remember our timeline? This is June 2020, a paper. The work was done and published in a couple months. Absolutely unheard of. It takes us years to publish a paper in a really good journal. It turns out the very same mechanisms are evident in patients infected with COVID, and it may be a way to tell who's responding to therapy and who's not. So that's kind of where we are. All of us online grew up with the Jetsons. So the future is really now, and I just want to end with this. This I Right before COVID, I had to give a talk in Chicago. I came off the runway from the um, plane, the tarmac, and this is what I was greeted with. This man, this is a commercial immunotherapy for cancer. His immune system has the potential to treat his cancer. So right where we started is where we're ending. These, these, these are out there commercially as well as at the really advanced elite cancer centers like Roswell Park. We're one of 50 some that's designated out of over 4,000 cancer centers. We are one of 50. So something I don't think is appreciated in the community. Um, you can now measure through incredible science. You can measure your status instead of going into the doctors. Is this coming soon, you guys? we can measure very accurately things. And so these biomarkers we're concerned about for COVID and for cancer, very likely we're gonna be able to read on our phone. I always wanna be able to give a talk where I can talk about a cell phone. And the last is um, space. I love this. So it turns out there's a whole world of research out there that I didn't know about until I started doing these University Express things a few years ago and thought I needed something to end with. But they, they're testing on the International Space Stations, immune boosting cancers with the idea for the people that are exploring outer space are going to be exposed to things, right? But also if we ever set up communities that live in outer space under microgravity, Cancer treatment in our immune system is very, very different. So there, these are these are going on now. Um, and one of the investigators is here at the University of Buffalo. And then also it's observed that infections, viruses are much more active in space than they are on um, trust you on Earth with gravity. So they are much more aggressive, much more infectious. So people are thinking that you can test for the drugs, one, you're gonna be concerned that this is gonna be a real problem if we have communities out living near Mars, but also the idea you can develop drugs and figure out what would be effective against the most aggressive forms. So I wanted to end with that because it's the most fun <laughs> of where things are going. And um, if there are any other questions, we, I know I took up most of the time, but if you have any questions, I'm really happy to answer anything, or you can email me as well. You feel free, you can find me through, if you um, search through Roswell Park. Oh, thank you, Dr. Evans, for that presentation. That was amazing. Thank um, you so much, Katie. I'm seeing one question. It looks like you might be seeing it too, but I can read it to you if you want. Um, I don't see a question. Wait, wait, I think I have to scroll down. So sorry. No, that's okay. I can also read it. You just let me know what you prefer. Wait. You mentioned that RNAs have slower can have slow cancer immunotherapy treatment mRNA. Okay, so they're using not the RNAs to slow cancer. 
Wait, wait, let me just read the rest of your question and make sure I understand it. What advances have been made to counteract this? So I think what I was trying to say, and maybe I misspoke, is that the mRNA formulation is being attempted not only by BioNTech, but many companies, um, we have a recruit under that's being exploring Roswell's option right now. They've been working on it for 10 years. So the mRNAs, not the RNAs that clip the RNA, but actually the coding, the messenger sequence. Uh, the one of the nicest analogies I've heard is think of an mRNA as an email. It is a message that comes to us and we read it and we hopefully understand it. Sometimes we act on it, sometimes we don't. And then if we are done, we might delete that email. Well, that's how the mRNAs are. They deliver their message and then they're deleted. So they're being used for, um, developed for cancer treatments. The trick here isn't so much the mRNA platform. They're very, very tricky because the body actually doesn't want them around. So luckily for us, the scientists developed a structure and modified the structure of the mRNA. That third company I mentioned that whose mRNA wasn't successful, they didn't do that. So that's probably in part why there wasn't success. So that's been partly what the holdup has been for cancer. But the cancer problem is tricky. And that we have is because COVID is totally foreign. It's like somebody coming from Mars. We know that's not us. In the case of cancer, this is, for example, if somebody has liver cancer, it's your own liver cell that's gone a little bad and makes it more aggressive, it takes over, but we don't exactly want to vaccinate against our liver cells, we need them, we need our lung cells. So there's the balance in cancer therapy, it's very hard to immunize and vaccinate against cancer. So these mRNAs are being used to try to treat cancer and try to go in and um, amp up the immune response. So use mutated proteins, et cetera. But there are a lot of cautionary aspects about that, that aren't the same for something as foreign as a virus. Hopefully that helps clarify it. Now, that being said, you know, the second part of your question was so important because what can be done? I will tell you this, there is no question that the successes that have come out of the mRNA platform for COVID vaccine will certainly fuel interest. You can see it when the stocks on these companies that have invested in mRNA. Um, BioNTech is completely as an mRNA company. So, you know, they, that's why they had that expertise. So um, there's no question that people are going to be less skeptical about the mRNAs because now they've shown such success worldwide. So I think that some of those things will go forward in cancer without the hurdles because of this um, advantage. So it's like one of the tiny slivers of silver linings, I think, that's come out of COVID. Fantastic question. Thank you so much for that. Thanks, Dr. Evans. A couple more things have come through. Do you have a couple more minutes for us here? I definitely do. I'm sorry I took so long. Um, no, please, no apologies. This is all fantastic. I think I got so excited about reading about the inspiration. I feel inspired myself. Let's see. Let me see if I can get down to. It's not actually that easy to see these, are they? Thank no. Um, Would you prefer if I read them to you? What tumors are best served by immunotherapy? Is that the next one that you see? Yep. Okay, great. So right now, the tumors that seem to be the best treated by immunotherapy, this is not a blanket across the board, but tumors like melanoma, non-small cell lung carcinoma um, have done really well. And they think that is because those tumors actually have a lot of mutations, just like COVID virus. It's mutating all the time. So these tumors have a lot of mutations. Now you might think that would be bad because it could be an advantage to a tumor cell to have mutations. But what happens is the immune system sees those mutated proteins and they say, they say, oh, this is not a normal liver cell. This is kind of like a spike protein and I better get ramped up. So the more mutations that a tumor has, the more chance the immune response will react. Now, the other end of the spectrum is something like breast cancer. It doesn't have as many mutations. So we're gonna have to play a lot more games to get the immune system tricked into thinking this is a, 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 a COVID vaccine or a COVID infection and instead now fight breast cancer. So yes, there are successes, but also 
Um, some of these cancers, like breast cancer, has a lot of those immune cells that are the bad guy cells um, that cause resistance. So it, it really is dependent. And I think, you know, we use this term personal medicine, but no two breast cancer patients are the same. One can respond, one won't. You know, no two melanoma patients. So that's why we need, have the need for biomarkers. Um, another one that doesn't respond very well to uh, examples that we're dealing with uh, that are so devastating are prostate cancer, as well as ovarian cancer. So um, right now, that's uh, we're we're learning a lot of lessons about why certain cancers don't respond. A lot of the ones that re don't respond, it's because of low mutation, and also they have a lot more of these suppressive networks that block the stop signals that block. So that's that's our real challenge. That actually happens to be on what my research is on. And then let's see. Can immuno immunotherapy cure cancer? Really good question. My personal belief is that we may not even need to have a total cure. By cure, at least what we mean scientifically, is that it's absolutely gone for your body. So it's possible that immunotherapy will never completely delete it from the body because these cancer cells can be pretty good at hiding out in just small numbers, one cell here, one small cell, cell there. And they're also really good at adapting. So as much as the immune system attacks them, they figure out ways around it. They, they lose the proteins on their surface that would be normally recognized. So that now they're almost like masked. So, so but in the end of the day, if we have an active immune system, and unlike a chemotherapy drug that you would have to take every day for the rest of your life, probably not a good advantage to their side effects, of course. But in the case of the immune response, it's primed and ready with these long lived response. We talked about 75 years, 50 years, 100 years, blah, blah, blah. So here we have a system that if the tumor does start to grow, if we have the immune system ramped up appropriately, we have the opportunity to come in and mop it up really quickly. So to me, that's going to be the functional definition of cure. And a lot of people actually feel that way, is that we can live with um, disease as long as we can control it. And uh, you know, they did some studies at Harvard, one of our colleagues did, um, was involved in this, where on autopsy, people that were um, unfortunately killed in car accidents, and they went in, people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, no evidence ever of having cancer, but when they looked at their tissues, they had aspects of cancer. So it's the kind of thing, but their immune system was so good at controlling it, it was never a problem. And they probably could have lived to 100 and never have had a problem. So that's, I think, what the goal is for a lot of us, uh, is the realistic goal is a cure will be how we define the word cure. But I think it, I really do think it is potential. I hope so. I hope we're in the Jetson stage, Jetson stage for that. And I hope that all our children certainly benefit as well as ourselves. We all are already. And was there any other question, Katie? Uh, there's a couple questions and comments. I can just read them to you, Dr. Evans, if that's oh, easy. Oh, I found one. Um, okay. <laughs> I am so interested in you. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your expertise. Thank you very much for listening and being so patient. Um, I was so interested in immunotherapy. Our bodies are marvelous. Sorry. This is just sort of sneaky. Our marvelous machines, and you clarified it for us. Of what consequence is it uh, that the origins of COVID are being questioned? Any thoughts on that? So there, there's a politically charged question. So um, I think most scientists are falling on the side, and I, I would agree with this personally, so it's my personal opinion that yes, it matters to a certain extent where it came from and whether it came naturally and evolved as a lot of scientists think, came through bats and then transformed and went into probably an intermediary type animal, maybe you know, uh, in the cow family type thing and then to humans or whether it came directly from a lab and escaped. And there are examples not, not you know, they were studying smallpox in London and they dropped the vial and some people were in the room, three died. 
So there are, you know, examples of that. I personally think that in the end of the day, that is pretty minor. It, how the, it evolved is not that informative in terms of how we treat it. So now we've got the problem and spending a lot of time on that and also setting up situations where there aren't cooperation. Um, because, because at this point, what has really driven the unbelievable speed of these advances, I don't know that I emphasized it enough, is that normally in clinical trials, they don't release any data. It's not top secret. I was in a, a Merck. We had to sign off our notebooks every day, top secret, because there would be patent laws and fights and you know, decade-long things based on our research. You don't normally reveal any results. These guys were re revealing their phase one and phase two and phase three data to the other people working on th therapies for COVID without, they were uncoding and revealing it early so that people could modify their design and try to make something better. So I feel like we don't want to affect cooperation between all the countries that are involved in this worldwide pandemic. So the question of where it came from and blame, um, I mean, I have to admit, I also am extremely interested in that and, uh, you know, the responsibility of how quickly it was revealed, how catastrophic this infection, those all things are, are social issues that have to be dealt with, but I don't think it affects how we approach designing therapies. The, um, I will say that China was very quick. Again, these things are not normally released. They go through publication, peer review. It's secret, secret. We have to sign things when we peer review um, for journals. I, I review for Nature all the time, and I have to sign that I will not tell anybody what I'm reading about because it's secret. China got out the sequence so that people like the group in Germany could make their RNA vaccine. They, they released it before it was ever published. Incredible. So I feel like that's probably the important aspect to think about in, in the whole big picture. Mind? Two sides to every story. Keeping in mind that there are two sides to every story, how do you address the other side of the story? I have told so many stories, I'm wondering which one. I. have seen presentations with vaccine statistics just as credible regarding the COVID vaccine. So I'm not quite sure. Um, I'm not sure what other side in terms of COVID vaccine that has that you're referring to in that question. Uh, Katie, do you have a clarification? There's a second part to that. So it says the rest of the question. So how do you address the other side when it's people think it's not safe because of longevity of use and what could happen. So I'm wondering if it's more looking like, what do you say to those people maybe, or how do you, how do you yeah, really yeah. live with that? I mean, I, no, I, I feel like in terms of that, we have to take the context, not just of this vaccine, but we now have over a hundred years worth of experience with vaccines and the outcomes for them. And I feel like that's what needs to come into consideration when we talk about um, the COVID vaccine in terms of uh, a worldwide protection. I don't think there's anybody showing the real data that can say that, co that the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19 disease is not incredibly infectious and it's getting more so. It's two times um, more chance of being hospitalized now with the D variant, the Delta variant than there was with the original. It's changing that fast within 10 months, a year, a year and a half. So um, so the, the, that aspect is just, it can't be questioned. So in terms of saying that the vaccines don't work, it's almost impossible to argue that because the numbers are there. We know what the incidence was and the likelihood of infection. And so I, I, I feel like maybe basing it on the hundreds of years of experience we have in terms of safety. And while these were accelerated, they were still done. Let's not forget, just, let's just, just Pfizer and Moderna alone had over almost 200,000 patients that went through these trials. And yes, there may be long-term effects. We're all concerned about cardiovascular, et cetera, et cetera. There may be some long-term effects that come out, but they are nothing compared to the death tolls if, if people got the infection. 
I think that's my best answer, at least. I think that's awesome. And did you see any others? Mine keeps flipping all the way back to the beginning. Sorry. So no, 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 that's okay. The last thing I'm seeing is thank you. Keep up the good work. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> good. <laughs> I'm trying. Well, you know, um, the end of the story is that grant that we submitted that I was so anxious and concerned about was funded, got a very high score, very, very high priority. Started in January. Um, it's a beautiful story, relevant in patience, frustrating to deal with it as a problem, but understanding the problem is so important. So for me, um, I'm at an age where, you know, I'm, I'm going to think about retirement at some point in the future. But for me, what will keep me going is the beauty of the story. I want to make sure it, it's going to be going into clinical studies, et cetera, et cetera. But we have the basic research and it's so riveting, just like these little stories that we talked about today, that that's what's going to keep me going on this five year, $4 million grant. So, so, so um, I will try to keep working hard for all of our sakes, including my own and my kids. So thank you so much for being so attentive. I really appreciate it. I love doing these and, and Katie, you do such a great job. And so I hope that I get to see any of you next year in person. I hope so too. And Dr. Evans will end with this comment. You're amazing, Sharon. I love your enthusiasm. And I agree. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I need to print these and put them up, up on my board to make me feel happy when the data <laughs> doesn't look as encouraging as I wanted to see. <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. And if anybody has any questions or needs any help in terms of directions of how, you know, who you might need to see or anything like that at Roswell, don't hesitate. You know, I, well, I'm not seeing patients. All, all my colleagues are, and we know exactly how to shut you to the right place. So um, good luck to everyone and stay safe. Great, thank you.